Okay, welcome everyone to uh, Topness Truth Juice. Uh, thank you very much for coming out tonight. Uh, really good to see an excellent turnout. Uh, and uh, thank you everybody, thank you uh, uh, Truth Juice for uh, inviting me along as well. Uh, what I'll do, I'll just e explain a little bit about why I'm here and what I'm doing here and, uh, and how it sort of started. Uh, like all the best things, it started by accident. Uh, I never actually went out of my way and decided, right, I'm going to start going and talking about debt and money and things like that. But uh, I was never interested in, in it, to be honest. Uh, it was the last thing that interested me. But uh, the more I found out about what it was, I got into debt uh, for a little while. And the more I found out about it, the more I was totally amazed by it. And so uh, I ended up uh, going down the local pub originally, and uh, I'll still remember this, because uh, he was down there. Uh, and I started talking about basically things that I'd come across that I thought were a little bit strange. The reason why I'm here, I, suddenly, I got into debt a few years ago. I sold a business and uh, suddenly uh, got started chased, being chased by debt collectors. And uh, I found it quite intimidating. And what I'm going to do is explain how I actually got over that. And, uh, and also what I found out about the banking system as well, because the more I found out about the banking system, the more I was totally amazed, you know, totally gobsmacked. So anyway, uh, I'll just start off. Before I start, what I basically say to everyone is uh, don't believe anything I say. Okay, just because I'm standing up here and I've got, you know, somebody recording me from the telly doesn't mean that, yeah, what I'm saying. Go and check it out. If, if anything I say interests you, then go and check it out. You know, we, we, we've got the internet now. It's so quick to actually uh, check things out. So check it out. And another thing I would say is uh, the ultimate ignorance is the rejection of something you know nothing about and refuse to investigate. So, by all means, come back to me and say, no, what you're talking about is rubbish. However, check it out for yourself first, you know. And, uh, you know, if you come back to me and say, uh, oh, hang on, I found this out, uh, I'm, you know, I'd be quite happy to enter into dialogue with any of you, uh, either over the phone or email or whatever, so, uh, and I can give you the details at the end. What I would say, if you've got any questions, uh, there is going to be a little point at the end for you to actually ask questions. So, uh, uh, it's a lot easier if uh, save questions to the end. But we will have a little chat, and uh, we'll be having a break uh, after about sort of four, uh, 50 minutes, an hour or so. so. Okay, what I'm going to talk about is basically uh, going to talk about you know, the banking system. And, you know, you, you're all thinking, oh my God, he's going to speak for an hour on the banking system. Well, it's not, I'm not... Uh, I'm really going to try not to bore you because I think it's fascinating. And does anyone know how to play Monopoly? Go a show of hands. Right. Anyone not played Monopoly? Anyone not played? So it looks like everyone in the room here has played Monopoly. Okay. Because if you understand the game of Monopoly, you can understand the global banking system. My understanding of the global banking system uh, doesn't get much more complicated than Monopoly. And when I started looking at the game of Monopoly and looking at the actual banking system that we have, I was totally amazed by what they have in common. Totally amazed. And I'll be sharing that with you. But anyway, Monopoly is still the world's number one board game. I'm quite surprised. But it is still, you know, it beats Scrabble and everything else. I prefer Twister myself. But. <laughs> so, there we go. Uh, so, and of course, how to win by understanding the rules. And we'll be talking about the rules of Monopoly uh, in a few moments. So, what we've got to look uh, at is it's just a game. I mean, there are people that get quite, I know people that play Monopoly and get really, really upset when they start losing. But you've got to realise it's just a game. As life is, you know, it's just a game. Uh, you need a token to play the game. So, has anyone got a favourite token when they play Monopoly? What was yours? The dog. The dog? We've got a dog. The old 
The old boot. Uh, top hat. Top hat, yeah. The car. So the car, yeah, that's what I got, the racing car. Corporate nice old 1950s. Corporate legal fiction straw man. <laughs> right, jumping ahead a little bit. <laughs> right, and in Monopoly, the currency used is just totally worthless paper. Well, you know, and you can actually get PD, PDF files if you need more Monopoly money, and you can print it off. So, uh, another thing is the bank in Monopoly, if you look in the rules, the bank never goes broke. It's remarkable. In the rules of Monopoly, uh, they actually, you know, if you get uh, uh, the rules of Monopoly, I actually did a little bit of research before doing this, probably enough, and you actually read in there, if the banker, in a game of Monopoly, if the banker runs out of money, what you do, you just get bits of paper and write like 100, 10, 20, whatever. And I thought, brilliant, that is what they're doing. <laughs> so, and the object of the rules, if you look at the older rules for Monopoly, uh, the object is to bankrupt all opponents. Now, and the newer, you know, the newer rules, you'll actually get, oh, you know, the idea is to actually end up with the most money. Well, if you end up with the most money, you're going to bankrupt everyone else. And I think we are seeing that in real life at the moment, with the way the banks are making more and more money. But I'll be talking about the banks in a, in a little bit. Uh, and to win, you need to know all the rules. There's no point trying to play a game if you don't know what the rules are. And also, with Monopoly, the game has to end at some point. It can't just carry on forever, because you know, all the money is going one way. So it can't just carry on. You, know, you, you don't get like two-week mono you know, Monopoly games, you know, where you get stalemates or something, because after a while, as soon as somebody ends up with most of the money, it starts you know, going straight towards the top, doesn't it? It goes towards the bank. So, uh, so you can realise that their plan is to take you for every penny you've got. And, you know, this, this, we're talking now, you know, with, with, with real banks now, uh, your plan is to stop them. And we're going to be looking at uh, different strategies for how you can actually start winning uh, the global financial game of Monopoly. Okay? So, they've got one tool which is really, really powerful. So, for anyone that gets... Uh, into debt, I'll be explaining why people get into debt as well. Because the same reason that people get into debt is the same reason that countries get into debt. Because money is created as debt. But, as I say, I, I don't want to jump ahead. What's the most powerful control they have over us? Then we'll like to hazard a guess. If it, hang on, I don't know. If, is that, if the sound's going that way? The police? The police? No, the police. Oh, belief, yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that, uh, the belief in the whole system. Anything else? The person. The per yeah, yeah, I'm just thinking something really simple, the most powerful uh, thing they've got against us is, somebody said fear, didn't they? Okay, so that's the most powerful weapon. When people get into debt, they get frightened. And when they get frightened, they start doing silly things as well. So, anyway. Your token to play the game. Just like, you know, you can't actually fit on the board of Monopoly. You need a token. And when you're playing Monopoly, you can choose whether you actually move your token around the board, or if you decide you want to stop playing, you can put your hands in the air and say, no, I don't want to play anymore. You know, you can move my, you know, I'm not playing, because I know that, you know, if I end up, I'm going to keep going, and I'm going to end up in prison. And in the actual global financial uh, game, okay, there's not debt as prison anymore, but what they will do, they will sort of uh, come after your assets and try and take your house away from you, or they'll try and get an attachment to your earnings as well. So uh, it's worth. So, does anyone got, I'm sure, because we've got quite a few truthers here tonight, uh, but anyone got any idea what your token to play the global financial game is? Signature, yeah, well, it's, you're in the right, certainly in the right direction there. Artificial person. Okay, what's artificial person? Corporation. Corporation, well, well, hang on, so you're saying we need a corporation. How can we possibly have a corporation? Well, it's actually quite interesting. 
Because it starts with your name. Your name is your token to play the game, the global financial game. Okay, now you'll be thinking, well, how come it's my name? If you notice on all your credit cards, and you can get your credit cards out if you're not sure, if anyone's got a credit card with their name that's not in uppercase, that's not all in you know, uppercase, then I'll give you 50 quid. <laughs> God, <they're> all, <laughs> there's a few people darting for their credit No one's got credit cards here, have they? <laughs> they're sensible. Okay. <laughs> you will find, the only card I've got with my name in title case, that's my, my first, you know, the first initial, sorry, the first letter in uppercase, the rest in uh, lowercase, is my cooperative membership card. And, but even then it says Mr. And when you see Mr. or Mrs. or Miss, that tie, you, that's telling you something. That's not your name. You, you, you're, you know, your friends don't call you, come up and say, oh, hello, Mr. Jones or something. Or they don't write to you in capital letters. Because I'll be going into this in a little bit more detail in a little bit while, in, in a little while. I'll, I'll actually explain how it's actually created. But what they do, they create a legal entity, effectively, and uh, you create it when you, well, it's created some time ago, but we will go back into that a little bit later. Because when you look at your, uh, when you look at your credit card, if you notice up there, it says authorised signature. Well, who are you authorising? You can't authorise yourself because you are yourself. So who are you authorising? by using, as somebody said, your signature. Yeah, so uh, as I say, we're gonna go into that in a little bit more detail. But you, as a human being, cannot contract with a fictitious entity, or a straw man, or a, you know, a company. You know, your bank is not actually a living, breathing soul, is it? it it's, it's a group of people uh, acting as a, what they call a corporate fiction. So, what they actually do is create corporate fiction with your name. But as I say, I don't want to go into that too much just at the moment. So, your contract with the bank is void, because you can't contract with them. And they don't like, so if you notice, uh, it's very rare you'll get somebody to, you know, two signatures uh, on, on these agreements, especially, and if they are, very often they're just initialed by the bank and uh, you don't get the name of who, whoever it is. So it's uh, a unilateral contract in most cases. Okay, uh, and, and this is the most incredible thing, I think. The currency used in the global financial banking system is totally worthless paper. Well, in fact, it's actually rare that it's paper these days because most of it is created on a, on a computer screen. But uh, there's our monopoly money. Well, what's the difference between monopoly money and the money which is printed by our government? Monopoly money is worth more. Well, <laughs> well it's, that's interesting, very interesting. Uh, I mean, at one time, there was silver or gold, there was certainly a lot of gold, backing our currency. That's gone. There is nothing of any physical value backing our currency, which is quite frightening, which means, it, which means it's completely worthless. But most of it isn't actually in coins or notes. Most of it, they bang up on a computer screen. It's frightening, quite frightening. Right, so can you believe it? The actual uh, makers of Monopoly have actually produced an electronic version of Monopoly. So, see, so your kids can actually start using credit cards in their games before they actually... Yeah, this, this, I find this quite remarkable myself. Uh, so, you'll get the, the one thing about Monopoly that was fun was having piles of notes in front of you, wasn't it? And um, what is the fun with having a credit card where you and you all, you know, oh, I'll make a transaction, you know, and you pop it in the little machine there. Look, there's a, I think there's a little machine that on, on the, uh, on the thing there. Where is it? 
Yeah, on, on, I don't know if you can see that. There's a little machine, you put your credit card in. I mean, it's crazy. What they're doing is actually basically brainwashing kids into accepting credit cards at a very early age, which I find is quite frightening. I really do. Okay, for a contract to be lawful, there must be something called consideration. This is in contract law. And uh, consideration is, has to be something of value coming to the contract. Now, if the money that they give us is totally worthless paper, how can it be of value? So, because of this, uh, we say that the actual, uh, you know, the contract is void because they haven't provided anything of real value. So, uh, you say, well, hang on, they've actually given you the money, and so you've got to pay it back. And I've had people uh, actually, so of course I go to a meditation group, and I had this lady that actually said to me, I couldn't possibly do what you do, because, you know, because I couldn't pay my credit cards off, and I said to the bank, well, look, if you can prove that I owe you anything, then I'm quite happy, gladly, pay you back. Now, what's the lady said, I couldn't possibly do what you do, uh, because uh, my spiritual church, uh, we learn personal responsibility. So, and I thought, oh my God, you know, that she's saying that I'm not responsible. So I turned around to her and said, well, it's my responsibility to actually tell everyone about this global banking fraud that we're involved with and actually start the fight back, which I think is what we're, you know, what we're doing. And this is why we've got, you know, so many people, you know, we, we've actually got a talk on money. Um, you could all be sat very comfortably at home and, you know, we've got a really good turnout tonight of people coming along, so thanks for that. So there's going to be a few people interested in what's going on at the moment, certainly. Okay, something else. The banker never goes broke. If the bank runs out of money, uh, the banker may issue as much money as needed by writing it on ordinary paper, as I said earlier. And there you go, there's a little cartoon there. What do you mean you need a bailout? You've got a kid with all the money, ain't bailed out in a monopoly. And of course, bankers, the house always wins. Not for much longer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and the object of the game is to bankrupt all opponents. And of course, you don't go to debtors' prison anymore. You know, you've got a you know, prison on the monopoly board, but uh, that's all there is. So uh, <coughs> they can make your life difficult, but we're actually working on some really good strategies now where we're actually now beating the banks and the debt collectors. So it's quite exciting. I'll be sharing that with you uh, in a moment. So just remember, their plan is to take you for every penny you've got. Your plan is to stop them. And of course, you're going to stand a much better chance of winning if you know what the rules are. So we're going to be looking at some of the rules about how to play Monopoly in just a moment. Okay, and you've got to realise that being in debt is one of the consequences of playing the game. Okay, why do you think the government is in debt? When they create money out of thin air, with interest, then you're bound to get, you're, you're bound to have people in debt. Because they're creating money and charging interest. Well, there's no money created to pay that interest off. Can you see? It, it's, this is, if you get a 12-year-old kid to understand this, it's so simple. It's because we've been living with this banking system for years that we think it's okay. But it's absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy. So governments are in debt. Companies are in debt. You know, you find a company running without an overdraft. You know, they have to borrow money just to keep going. And of course, a lot of us end up in debt as well. And it's through no fault of our own. If you've got kids to feed, it's very difficult to do it. You know, within the, in the current financial climate without having to borrow money occasionally. And the thing you've got to understand is there isn't actually enough money in circulation to pay off all the debts. And if you don't believe me, get onto the Bank of England website and you can actually look up, I think it's the M2 money supply, 
Okay? And that's all the money in circulation and all the money held in banks. Okay? And add that up, well, you don't have to add it up, they give you the figures on the Bank of England website. Uh, you look it up, and it's actually less than what is owed, well, what the government debt is. Okay, so, uh, but the important thing is to remember it's just, a, it's just a game. So it's something you can have some fun with. And I'm going to be explaining, you know, how I had a lot of fun playing around with debt collectors. And, and you really can, you know. I, I, it started off, I was in fear, I, I was getting intimidated, and I realised I was getting intimidated, and I was getting feared up, and it was making me, I wasn't sleeping, but then I thought, you know, I did a bit of sort of like work processing, hang on, something going on here, and then once I realised what they were up to, I thought, right, now yeah, time to fight back. So, yeah, all very exciting. So, I'm going to tell you basically how to win the game, how to win against the uh, global bankers. But just before we start, uh, you've got to remember that they are only doing their job. Okay, so yeah, don't be too harsh on them. They don't know what they're doing. They've just been told, and they've got to feed their family and their kids. But uh, uh, what I do say before we start is the secret to winning the game for everyone is to assume a deficiency of love in your, in your opponent and apply some. Okay, so... You don't have to be rude to these people. Uh, they can be very rude to us, but what we're trying to do is educate them. And we're trying to explain to them uh, that, uh, you know, we're trying to do it without lying, without deceit, and without being rude, if at all possible. It's very difficult sometimes when they're being rude to us, but if you, you, know, if you can do it without being rude. Uh, what I would suggest is... Uh, you know, use it for credit cards and overdrafts, loans, things like that. If you're, you know, if you're finding it difficult to pay them back uh, and you're struggling, then by all means, use, use the system. I wouldn't use it for mortgages. There are some websites that deal with mortgages. Uh, my particular website and my particular uh, skills don't lie in mortgages, so there are better people off. Uh, and utility companies can be rather difficult because they immediately cut you off. But there is, there is a way of getting around them, but I don't want to go into that just at the moment. But uh, what is great is that as I meet more and more people, then as people are trying different things, I don't think there's any one way to beat the system. Uh, but as I say, we're beating the system honestly, truthfully, and lawfully. And, and just one thing, because people say to me, you know, uh, well, uh, would you actually, you know, how come, you, you know, if you've been given the money, shouldn't you be paying it back? Well, I'm saying, well, the money is not worth anything, but my scenario is if I lent you, say, £10,000, and as you're just spending the last, like, couple of pounds, you suddenly realise that, hang on, it's a dud no. It's, and I've actually given you counterfeit money, would you pay me back with real money? No, you wouldn't. No, no. Well, if somebody lends you counterfeit money, would you pay them back? Would you go out and earn money to pay you back? No, you'd say, no, you've just done me over. I'm not paying you back. And this is essentially what we're doing. But we're sort of asking them some nice, uh, difficult questions. Well, they're not actually that difficult, but what we do is say, ask for an invoice. Okay? So, basically, you ask for an invoice. And you ask for it in your name. You don't ask for it in your uppercase name, or you don't want it in your name with Mr. or Mrs. or Ms. or Doctor or whatever your, you know, whatever your title is. Okay? Uh, and all this information is on the website. So, uh, by all means, take notes. I see a few people uh, scribbling away. But all the information is on the website. I'll be giving you uh, the address for that uh, in a bit. Ask for proof of a lawful contract. And you can actually ask for, well, show me the contract. And this is something you can ask for. And with debt collectors, you can ask them for proof of agency. And then, so you give them all these questions, and this is just one way. We've got a few different uh, strategies. Uh, some of them are easy, even easier than this one. But then you give them 10 days to respond. 
And if they don't give you all this information in 10 days, you say, well, look, if I don't hear from you within another 10 days, uh, we are agreed to the following terms. And those following terms are that you don't owe them anything. Because if they can't prove, you know, if, 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 if say, if uh, you've lent me some money and uh, you want your money back, and I say, well, prove it. You say, well, yeah, I gave you the money, or, you know, there's some sort of proof, that, you know, you might have had somebody, uh, you know, if they can't prove it, then basically, you, you know, you don't owe them anything. Or you could say, oh, all the debt's been paid. And you can also add, and this one doesn't always work, but you can also add that any negative remarks made to a credit scoring agency will be removed. They don't always hold out to this one, but on the site there is a, a part on, you'll be surprised how easy and how quickly you can repair a credit, uh, you know, your credit score. However, I don't honestly think the system is going to last. It normally takes about 18 months to repair your credit, uh, and it's very simple, but I don't honestly think the banking system is going to last that long. But we shall see. Okay, and you also ask that they no longer pursue you. Uh, don't, under any, any circumstances, speak to them on the phone, unless, of course, you refuse to be intimidated by them. Don't offer to pay anything especially with debt collectors. And the most important thing is don't get scared or worried. You know, the only power they have over you is fear. Once you step out of fear, that empowers you. They can't actually do anything once you step out of fear. And also, when you actually start giving out a different energy, it starts changing the reality around you. For those of you who are into consciously creating your uh, reality, so uh, it starts with uh, getting out of fear. Now you can realise that debt collectors buy the debt from your... So, say if you go into debt with your, your bank, your bank will send you a few letters. They might even pass it to a solicitors and they'll threaten to take you to court. Uh, and then you'll find uh, they'll pass it to debt collectors. Now, they actually sell it to the debt collector for about 10p in the pound. And, well now, the thing is, if the debt collector actually buys it from the bank, under the Bills of Exchange Act, which governs financial transactions, if that bill is paid off, then the debt is then discharged. You can look it up on the Bills of Exchange Act. So you'll, you'll, you know, as soon as it's gone to a debt collector, you don't owe anything. And debt collectors are really sneaky. Excuse me, I just need a glass of water here. Debt collectors are really sneaky, because what they'll do, they'll say, if you can't offer to pay them anything, what, what do they normally say? Anyone dealt with, I won't ask anyone if they've dealt with debt collectors. I'm sure they've sort of, can't be just me, but uh, yeah, there's a few hands going up surreptitiously here. So what do they say if you, if you say, well, look, we can't afford to pay you? What do they often say? Give us a pound, don't they? Sorry, who was that that said that? Oh, right, yeah. They'll say, just pay us a pound a month or something like that. They'll do that. Now, why would they do that? Why would they ask for a pound a month when, yeah, because most people can afford a pound a month, even if you're on the dole, you know. So why would they ask for a pound a month when it's going to cost them more to actually get that transaction into their bank account? You get contracts with you, yeah. As soon as, because if I say, look, I'm sorry, I don't owe you anything, but look, here's a fiver. Well, by giving you any money or giving a debt collector any money, what you're doing, you're implying that, you know, what you're basically saying that, yes, I've got a contract with you. And if you didn't have a contract, you've actually now got a, a, an implied contract or a tacit contract, as we call it. So, yeah, it, don't fall for their tricks. But saying that, I know people that do fall for that, and I fell for it as well. But they had a pound a month for a couple of months, and once I realised what was going on, it soon stopped. And they didn't get anything else out of me. <laughs> they got a few good phone calls, but I'll go on to that. <laughs> so, what you could realise is a verbal agreement with a debt collector is actually more enforceable than a unilateral uh, contract with a bank. Okay? So, don't agree to pay anything until they can provide you with evidence 
that you actually owe something. And now also on the, on the, uh, on the website now, for those of you that can't be bothered to write letters or are just plain lazy, much like myself, uh, there's a, a, a lovely little, uh, we've got these stickers that you can download off the website. And it's basically no contract return to sender. I think Dan's seen these before. And, uh, we've also got uh, uh, a few little words on there. Uh, you can also get them off TPUC. Uh, theirs are probably even brightly, more brightly coloured than ours. It doesn't matter where you get from. You can scrawl in pen across the, uh, across the letter. But if you do get it off a website that they know about, then uh, they sort of, they're more likely to give up because they know that you're already onto them. So what it says is, uh, I do not recognise you. I do not understand your intent. It is not my will nor wish to contract. I do not have an international treaty with you. No assured value, no liability. Okay, and this is just a bit of legal uh, twaddle. Sorry, lawful twaddle. twaddle. Got to be very careful between legal and lawful. But, uh, and also now, what we are doing, we're doing copyright and trademarking your name. So what, what we're actually doing is taking control of our names, of our legal fiction, if you like. And it's quite a simple process. Uh, it just involves a few letters. We run through it. I'm not going to go through it in any great detail just at the moment. Uh, but you can see uh, there was a, what you can do is actually produce a rubber stamp uh, which has your name in it and uh, the date and also your name with trademark on it. So uh, once you've actually trademarked your name, uh, then it actually makes it very, very powerful. Because the next thing you do in your next letter is actually give them a fee schedule. <laughs> and uh, I'll read this out because I love this. Uh, uh, we've got one of the guys off the forum. Uh, we've got a, a great forum on the website. And there's some excellent guys that have actually overtaken me now. Uh, because uh, whereas you know, the last time I was playing this game properly was about two or three years ago. So things have moved on a little bit by then. The technology has improved, if you like, and uh, the game has risen up because the banks, initially the banks gave in really easily, but then they thought they stuck getting a lot of these people, and we're getting thousands of people using these letters. So uh, we have to improve them. But anyway, what, what we actually say here is, you have not proven any debt. Uh, so uh, if you sell the alleged liability, pass it back to your client, and or appoint an agent to act on its, your behalf on this matter, you will have broken our agreement and will agree to pay the following schedule, which is three times what they are claiming for dishonouring our agreement, a thousand pounds per hour or part thereof uh, of authorised representative's time, uh, and then, uh, and that's nunc pro tunc, which is... Uh, basically acting retrospectively. And then £1,000 per recorded delivery response. Also, any further contract you now have is uh, unnecessary. If, however, you deem to, uh, you need to contact me again by phone, then the fee is £100 per item. And, you know, if, if they don't actually pay up front, then you charge them £1,000 per item. And then, what you do, you invoice them. And uh, this is actually frightening debt collectors now. It really is frightening debt collectors because they're starting to get these, we're sending contracts to them. You know, it's like we've, we've realized that this is a scam. And once you wake up to the fact that this is a scam, then you know, we can actually play uh, and you know, beat them at it. It's great. I mean, you can really have some fun with this. Uh, as I say, when I started off, I was honestly fearful. I was getting really nervous. I was married at the time because I thought, oh, you know, um, my wife had a business. And I thought, oh my God, you know, this is going to make things really difficult. And it was only when I woke up to the scam because one minute they'd come after me for £5,000. Next moment, it'd be the same sort of account and it'd be £10,000. And I was thinking, well, hang on, there's something really, really strange here. So, uh, what, you know, what I sort of did was actually wrote to them and said, well, show me how you came to this figure. And they said, well, how about if you pay us 7500 I said, how about if I pay you nothing? And then when they started phoning me up, what I'd do 
Because you know how they phone you, well, anyone that's been in debt will know uh, if you've had debt collectors tracing you. And it is a large percentage. I think it's about 35-40% uh, of people in this country have had debt collectors tracing for one thing or another. It might even be higher than that now. Uh, but what they'll do, they'll phone you up. And I, they've had me phoning me up at work as well, which can be embarrassing unless everyone at work knows what you're up to. And, you know, now I sort of like say, oh, well, if they phone me at work again, just like, you know, what you do, you say, oh, just one moment, I'll just go and see if he's around, you know. And they'll just sort of look, put, the, put the phone down and just leave them. And after two or three minutes, you just check they're still there. Because three minutes is about the time that they will actually hang on the phone for. So after three minutes, what I tend to do is go back and say, oh, are you still there? Oh, just one, yeah, okay, just a minute. And you don't lie to them. You don't say, uh, if it's you that picks the phone up, you won't say, oh, he's out, because A, that'd be lying, and that'd be dishonourable and untruthful. So what I do is say, oh, just a moment, as if you're going to get them, and you just put the phone down. And I sort of, what I like to do is sneak away very quietly, just for, I don't know why, just a sort of comic effect. And it, it's just something, it just makes it fun, you know, it's a game, you know, so you might as well enjoy playing it. Uh, another one I do is, what they try and do is, if, if you've ever, ever had this, they will ask you uh, security questions. So what you do, when they, and they're phoning you and asking you for security questions. Well, you know, if, you know it could be anyone phoning you, it could be a, a prank call for all you know. So what I do, I ask them the security questions first. I say, well, can I have your full name, please? And your middle name? And can I have your uh, job title, please? Uh, can I have the name of your uh, line manager and his job title and his line manager and your direct telephone number? And your mobile number? <laughs> they don't always go for that. But what you do, <laughs> I've got about 10 questions. You have them down by the phone and you ask them all these questions. And they're great to say, uh, and then they sort of start getting a little bit shifty and say, right, is that okay? Now, yeah, that's fine. Thank you very much. Now, how can I help you? They say, well, we'd like to ask you some security questions. And I'm saying, I'm sorry, I don't want to deal with this over the phone, but if you'd like to send me a letter, I'll gladly read it. <laughs> but I'll also open it, put on no contract return to sender and send it back to them. So yeah, you can have some fun with this. You really can have some fun. And the most important thing is that you get out of the fear. Okay, and you know, it's great. It's the website now. We've got over 9,000 people signed up on the forum. Uh, we've probably got more than that on the main site. So, really, really exciting. Uh, we have some very basic sort of rules when we, uh, uh, that we, we try and stick with. If, if you're going to actually go down this route, what I would suggest is always be truthful. Yeah, what we're trying to do is actually bring down a fraudulent system. And so us being fraudulent or not telling the truth, what we're trying to do is set an example for them. Okay, so what we can do, we've got to be sort of whiter than white and behave it. So always be truthful. Always respond politely. I mean, these people, they are human beings. Okay, they might be misguided and greedy and a lot of other things. But, you know, uh, you know, there's no point being rude to them. Act honourably, you know, uh, you know, try not to ignore them because you have a lot more fun, you know, if, if you go to sit in the advice, they'll always say, well, don't ignore your debts, you know, you mustn't ignore them. However, it's actually a good strategy, but it's not very honourable. And always act lawfully within the law, but then not necessarily statute law. But uh, I'm not, not going to go down that road too much. And what I would say is don't be greedy. Uh, the bankers are greedy. Uh, you know, if we decide that we're going to get, you could do it quite easily. I know I could do it quite easily. I think I've almost repaired my credit rating for a third time now. After I, it's just getting good again. Okay. But now I've actually got a proper debit card rather than an electron card. So I'm working my way back into, uh, not that I'm going to have time because I honestly think the banking system's going to collapse quite shortly. So, but don't get greedy. Don't go out and get a load of credit cards and, and go and buy uh, a Porsche or something like that because you're just going to start behaving like a greedy banker. I did say greedy banker, anyway, so. Okay, and uh, what, what is quite nice, uh, and, and this is one of my trophies uh, which I'm putting up, 
This is a page of the Guardian newspaper, and uh, debt collectors hit out at advice websites. I'm not going to read it all the way through, but there is a link on it on the news bit of our website. And uh, basically, the Society of Scumbag Debt Collectors, uh, the, they call it the CSA, not the Child Support Agency, but the, I think it's the Consumer Services Association. Okay, and they get together and they do a little PowerPoint presentation, probably a lot more boring than this one. Uh, and, uh, and they think about ways that they can actually improve their profit margins by you know, making more money out of some of the poorest people in our society. Okay, and they got pissed off with the fact that there's five, there were five websites they didn't like. Consumer Action Group, Blogger, uh, Blogger.com, Penalty Charges Forum, and get out of debt free .org. So uh, I was well trapped. And the great thing is that uh, Guardian newspaper actually put it on their website, and God bless the Guardian newspaper, they put on uh, links to the website. So I went from floundering about the third page, if you put in get out of debt, uh, I was floundering on the third page of Google. And uh, after this, got me onto the, you know, the first page. If you now put in Get Out of Debt, or a few other things, Mary Elizabeth Croft and quite a few other ones, we're now on the first page, at the top of the first page, underneath the adverts, but the top of the normal Google ranking uh, for you know, a number of the search terms. We're actually above the government website on a lot of search terms. So more people are now coming to this website Rather, and, and also Consumer uh, Action Group as well, another great website. And TPUC, if you, if you look at council tax, uh, you know, there's a lot of great sites, a lot of information out there now. So. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the uh, new website. Uh, which uh, is, uh, I think I've actually... Uh, Showing it before, uh, there's a lot of, uh, if you notice, there's a little bit of monopoly symbolism that you might notice. It tends to be the older sort of stuff as well. So it's the old little uh, banker getting out of his cage. But uh, anyway, uh, has anyone actually come across the site before? Has anyone, any show of hands? Yay. Yeah, we've got a handful. So uh, uh, it's going to be all very new, but uh, even if you saw the old one, uh, I designed the old website and uh, it was very yellow and very <laughs> bright and uh, being an, uh, not you know being an amateur at pretty well everything uh, it wasn't the best designed site but the new website if you if it looks a little bit uh, dare I say it, not corporate but it looks a little bit more grown up and uh, people are responding to it better it's also sort of content managed the Actual letters now, because people sometimes say, oh, can, you know, I can't download your letters, I've got a problem downloading. Can you send them to me? Well, the actual website now works out which country you're in, because it's now covering, uh, is it, yeah, seven countries. We've got UK, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and Ireland. Basically, all the Commonwealth countries, and I include America, as a Commonwealth country, because the I don't believe that America really ever got its independence from the Crown of England. Not being anyway, but I don't want to go down that one because that's a whole talk in itself. But uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, we've got there's quite a few things that uh, the new website's got. Uh, more countries added, uh, more professional layout. It's also got you know the, the copyright and trademark and with a copyright trademark you need stamps it well it's best to do it with stamps you can actually write your name across a stamp they actually suggest you put a stamp on it but uh, we haven't got it working quite yet we're still fixing a couple of little glitches but uh, we should have it working within the next week or so but you will be able to actually print out a, uh, a like a stamp so rather than actually having to buy rubber stamps to do your copyright and trademark procedure uh, you'll be able to put the stamp through your printer and the website will automatically put your name in a little curve with the date and copyright and then it'll put trademark in capital letters automatically. So we're, we're talking about quite a complex site. And of course it's 
creating the letters, the website will work out which country you're in, and when you download a letter, it will automatically put in the statutes for your country, as long as you're in one of those six or seven countries, whatever it is. So uh, if you're in the UK, it will put UK statutes in. So I think it's, uh, Dan, I think it's dynamically created, is it? I'll see Dan. Yeah. So, so, uh, so yeah, it's all very clever. And also, something else uh, we'll be bringing in is uh, you also will be able to put your details into the website, and then it'll put your details in, you know, like your straw man name in lowercase, and your, uh, sorry, your straw man name in upper caps, and your, you know, living, breathing soul name as well, so. Uh, we've also uh, got uh, lots of bit social networking as well, so we've got, what, Facebook, Twitter, somebody, if anyone, does anyone know how to Twitter? It's got, it can't be that difficult, because I know a lot of people do it, but I haven't actually got a clue. And I've got a Twitter page now, and I haven't actually done any, is it tweets? So if anyone can give me a 10 minute crash course in <laughs> tweeting or twittering or whatever it is, uh, that would be quite useful. What we're gonna do, really brief history of money. Okay, so, and I'll try and make it as interesting as possible. So how did it all start off? A leaf. A leaf. <laughs> Yeah, trading leaves. I don't know. Was it, what was the first form of exchange? Bartering. Bartering, did somebody say? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, bartering. So, what you did, you actually exchanged goods with each other. And it works out quite well because, you know, there's no debt going on. Uh, you know exactly what you're getting. It's a little bit difficult because you actually have to carry your eggs or your, you know, but. Uh, this happens a lot around where I live because, and I'm sure it happens around Totnes as well, because an awful lot of you uh, are all sort of, uh, seem to be, uh, Totnes seems to be one of these little power centres where there's an awful lot of like-minded people coming together. So, uh, anyone do a bit of bartering? Hands up, give us a bit of feedback. Yeah? Oh, good stuff, good stuff. Yeah, because we've got some barterers. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay. And then uh, came uh, using precious metals uh, created into uh, coins, okay? Which, yeah, worked really well. You know, they had a few sort of downfalls. They weren't perfect because uh, people would do clipping, I believe. They used to clip coins, which is where they'd nick a little bit, file a little bit off. Every time you have a coin, you file a little bit off the edge. So then they started serrated edges and then writing around the edge and things. But yeah, worked well. And then, and these things, does anyone know what that is? It looks like a flute. Ah, so yeah, we've got some, uh, we've got some. Then who's come across this thing called a tally stick? Yeah. Can we just show our hands? Give me a bit of feedback, please. Yeah. Yes, we've got one, two, yeah, we've got about 10 people in the room. Who's not come across these things? Oh, there's quite a few people not come across. This has been written out of history. This was really, really big. When the Bank of England was started, it actually held an awful lot of tally sticks. And a tally stick, it, it's so simple. You could go out and make, if you've got a pen knife, you can make a tally stick. And you can't, you get a credit card, you get some, you know, whiz kit that, you know, I'm sure Dan can probably do this. He's, uh, he can probably, you know, you get a, a credit card, you can actually clone them quite easily. I don't know, if you've, got, if you've got the kit, you can actually clone them, apparently. But uh, you c a tally stick, there's no way. You can't clone a tally stick. Impossible. What it is, it's a bit of hazel. Uh, you, you, somebody gets a knife and they t turn it into a square. And then they put notches in it. And then they split it in two. And then they write on the inside of you know, a few bits. But basically, it, even if most people were illiterate about this time, it was around sort of medieval time onwards. Uh, but the notches actually said how many pigs or sheep or gold coins or whatever. And basically, you go back and to actually match it up, you actually take it back. And, and you actually, so the lender would have one half and the you know, borrower would have the other half. And then coming back to payback time, the two pieces go together. And you cannot, it was, it was a wonderful piece of kit. Now, what was interesting, the handle of the tally stick was called the stock. And so you would hold the tally stick by its 
by the handle, wouldn't you? So you would be holding stock. You would be a stockholder if you had a, uh, a tally stick. And you'd, get, you'd also get, uh, you'd get markets where they actually start trading them. And what were they called? Oh, well, you know, I'd have to tell you. They were called stock markets. I mean, this is, this is like, you think, well, where do these words come from? I, I find the words, when you actually follow the trail, this is interesting. This is why I'm doing a bit of the history of it, because this is where the fraud was going on for a long time. It's been going on for a long, long time. And so we can actually look, look back. It's a way of controlling. I think it was Jesus tracking the money lenders out, out, the, out the synagogue. You know, it's like, uh, allegedly. I mean, it, it's been going a long time. So you get stock markets, holding stock, putting stock, and, you know, and you get livestock, don't you? So, you know, it, it's, it's all these wonderful words that come back from a stick that we used. And of course, the next form of currency, which we've got now, fractional reserve banking, and fiat currency. Fractional reserve banking means that if I was a bank and I had £100, I can lend out £900. Not only can I lend out £900, but I can, use, I, I can actually lend it out with interest. And I don't even have to print the money or uh, create the coins or anything. I can do it on a computer. And you're still getting banks that are going bust because they are so greedy that they're lending money to people that can't possibly pay it back. And they, 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 let, you know, they give people, sell mortgages. And then they sell all the actual mortgage, and that goes on, and uh, it, 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 it's crazy, absolute crazy. And it's fiat currency. Fiat currency means that the currency is of no value, no intrinsic value. It's not worth anything. There's no gold backing it. If you think there's gold backing it, it went a long time ago. It's more difficult in this country to see exactly what went on because the Bank of England has always sort of been in the shadows a little bit. In America, the history of the Federal Reserve Bank is much easier to see how the central bank hijacked the country. But the Federal Reserve Bank is, in my opinion, only a satellite of the Crown of England. And I don't think the crown of England is the royal family. It is the, in my opinion, it is the city of London. That's where the power is. The limited liability fiction. Limited liability fiction. Yeah, yeah. So more, more fiction, total fictional entities. And what's remarkable is the Queen of England, when she actually goes to the city of London, she actually has to walk behind the Lord Mayor because she's not in her uh, jurisdiction anymore. So she walks behind the Lord Mayor. It's remarkable because the City of London isn't part of London. It's not part of, of England. It is an independent sovereign state. I don't want to go too much into this, but for those of you that are interested, other independent sovereign states, uh, you know, think of the Vatican City, and you think of uh, Washington DC, all got, and they've all got, I'm going totally off the, uh, off my sort of notes now, but what was wonderful is that they've all got these wonderful uh, obelisks, you know, I say bang in the middle, in the middle of most of them, uh, on the edge of the city of London, it's next to Thames. But uh, yeah, so you've got the financial centre, the uh, war, you know, the uh, defence, so-called defence, uh, and you've also got the, well, basically the military. So you've got uh, finance, uh, you've got military, and then you've got religious. And the three things being the power structure, pretty well on the planet. Anyway, I digress. So, how did we get in all this mess? I mean, how did it all start? Okay, so we're going to go look a little way back. And we're going to look at Admiralty Law. We're going to look at, you know, start looking at uh, yeah, how we, how we got, got in this mess. And I'm going to keep it really, really simple. I can remember when I started a business, I had a, a business which I was telling Steve about earlier, but I won't go into it uh, just at the moment. 
Uh, when you go into business, I can remember going along to Nat West and saying, can I open a business account? And he's laughing now. <laughs> okay, I might tell you at the end. If any, anyone remembers, uh, Alistair knows <laughs> yeah, about my business. But anyway, I, I went along to Nat West and I said, Look, I want to start a business. They said, oh, here we go. We're very interested because we like you to start businesses because we can make money out of you. So anyway, so you get your little booklet and it says, well, you've got three options. You can either be a sole trader, you can be a partnership, or you can be a limited company. I thought, well, that was interesting. So I sort of looked into it. I thought, well, that's interesting. Well, a sole trader, what's that? Well, a sole trader would be like you and I. And I see that as not an S-O-L-E, sole, as in S-O-U-L, a sole trader. We are living, breathing, aren't we? So we are souls. We are alive. Okay? And uh, so there's an old guy pushing his wheelbarrow. And you get a partnership, don't you? This is why, yeah, we, we keep going, for some reason, it always goes back to, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of sort of reference to maritime uh, and admiralty. Uh, uh, so you get a partnership, which I think came from like a whole load of people, a whole load of souls coming together on a ship. So they would have a partnership. And then you'd have a company. Well, where else do we get companies? You get, you, you, you get a lim limited liability company. This is a legal fiction. This is a, you know, this is what, you know, if you like, the straw man. This is a fictitious entity. But where else do we get companies? The ships. We always get a ship's company, don't we? Fascinating. There we go, there we go, we've got a, a, a ship's company. It's fascinating because there's lots of references to, you know, the sea and, and it carries on. And this is, uh, a, you know, this is, if you want to go into this further, the, the man to, uh, you know, get on the, to Google and look up Jordan Maxwell. For me, he is, I, I mean, he's one of the greats. He was looking into the truth, he, you know, he, he was one of the sort of grandfathers of the truth movement and he's still very, very active today. But anyway, uh, so, uh, but a anyway, when a, when a ship travels through uh, in into harbour, well, before it gets to the harbour, it might go up an estuary, mightn't it? Or it might even go up a little bit of a river or something. And on the side of the rivers, what do we find on the side of rivers? Banks. Banks, don't we? It's remarkable. Because the banks, something has to control the current, or, you know, the current sort of moves between the current, of course it's the currency, isn't it? Because the banks control the currency, don't they? And you might be thinking, oh well, you know, it's just words. But our words, it's very, very interesting how our words have evolved. How banks and, and you know, and the ship comes into harbour. And when it comes into harbour, what is the term for coming, coming into harbour? Docked, yeah, or birth, yeah. It's known as birth, and when it comes into you know when it comes into the uh, harbour and it births, there's going to be some paperwork involved because that you know basically the harbour master wants to get all the goods off the ship and off in trucks or you know wherever. So the bit of paperwork, so the ship's captain comes up with a bit of paper, and this is called a shipping manifest to certify what is now manifest on the land. So it's come from the sea and it's now manifest on the land. land. And so it's handing title, the captain is handing title for, of the goods to the harbour master so he can have them removed. Because then if anything's dropped, it's not the ship captain's fault anymore because he's handed responsibility to the harbour master. So the harbour master actually takes on behalf of the crown funny enough, because the harbour master will be employed by the Crown. Remarkable, City of London again. Now, when you have a child, when a child is born, it's funny because it actually travels down a birth canal, and the, it's carried on waters because the waters break, and it is birth or delivered, like UPS deliver something, don't they? They deliver things. 
Now tell me if this is all, you know, if this all just happens by accident. And of course there's going to be paperwork involved, hasn't there? Well, there's a couple of doctors in the room tonight, but uh, there's going to be a bit of paperwork. And I don't know what the initial, there's a, a first bit of paperwork that's going to be signed saying, oh, this trial, so the waters break, the child comes down the birth canal, is delivered or birth, gives birth. And of course there's a piece of paper that has to be signed of where you get the birth certificate. Because the parents are required to register the child. Register, regis, goes back to the crown. You are handing title to the crown. So that child is no longer yours. You basically pass the title of your child to the state, well, not the state, the crown, which is a fictitious legal entity in the city of London. And from that, apparently, they create a bond. And of course, bonds, are, well, you know, bonds, you, you float them on the stock market, don't you? You always float things on the stock market because it's all down to admiralty law. But what we're doing is, you know, we're creating bonds, but of course, when you create a bond, you end up in bondage. Now, I had to go through an awful lot of uh, Google images before I could <laughs> <laughs> use it, come to one that I could actually show in public. And, uh, but isn't it weird, sort of, uh, isn't it weird? You know, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm not asking actually what they do in their private lives. Uh, far from it. But isn't it weird that you know people have fantasies about bondage, about being tied up? Well, I tell you what, my fantasies are about freedom and about being free from this responsibility. Not anarchism, where you know everyone starts fighting or well, real anarchism. That, that doesn't, there's no reason why that should happen. But uh, when you, we realise that we have been in bondage to legal fictions and control for an awful long time, so much so that the words are now part of our language. And what is wonderful is that people are now waking up. But of course, once we're in bondage, we become the livestock. And that's a, one of these images. I absolutely love these images. So uh, I actually got into trouble for uh, referring to people as sheeple uh, that uh, w weren't quite woken up. But uh, yeah, I mustn't use that term, but I do like it. So I would say we have been unwittingly sold into slavery, into bondage, with our birth certificate. Because with our birth certificate, they created the bond and they created the legal fiction. Okay. Now, when I say the banks create money out of thin air, well, it's not strictly true because what they do, they create that bond, okay, they sell it because they think, right, we have this individual and apparently, it's very difficult to actually confirm this, but I have it on very good authority and uh, a lot of investigators believe that a bond is created and floated because they can actually work out that we are going to create a lot of money in our, or a lot of labor, a, a lot of wealth in our lifetime, because the chances are that we're gonna work for a number of years. So they can actually raise money from our birth certificate, creating that bond, okay? And when we need some money, when we actually sign the credit card, when we want to borrow some money, we are borrowing against that bond. And apparently that bond is, does anyone know what the bond is reputedly? Because we've got some pretty good it's truthers. A, it's what's known as a tom, tom team, so it's a forward account, basically. Right. From what I understand. Right. So actually it's worth more money than it's in existence. Right. Right. Okay. So getting 5k out for, uh, for a, you know, on, on your credit card limit is like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> not an awful lot. Yeah. That's why your bank needs your signature, because you're effectively accessing your own funds. 
But uh, I, I want to keep it really simple, so I don't want to go down too much down that road. So, looking at the actual amount of debt that we're in, uh, because there, are, I'm sure there are some people who say, well, it, it doesn't apply to me because I'm not in debt. Well, I'm sorry that every single person is, well, apart from the fact that you can't possibly be in debt because you're a living, breathing soul, and living, breathing souls cannot be in debt. Only your straw man can be in debt. So, uh, you know, when people say, oh, can you, you know, is there any way, you, you know, you, uh, you know, I want to get out of debt. I say, well, you're not in debt. It's only your token to play the game, remember. Your straw man, this, this legal fiction which is in debt. No one here is in debt. But the government pretends we are. Because we've got the national debt, which we all have to share, which is wonderful. And because we've got to pay it back, despite the fact that I've already said, there is no way we can pay it back. No way. Every time a politician goes on the television and starts talking about cuts because we've got to pay off the deficit, they are lying because it cannot be paid back. It can't. There is absolutely no way it can be paid back. And anyone, any politician that is saying that, you know, we've got to reduce education, you know, we've got to spend less money on education and we've got to, like, you know, get, have less policemen and less this and less that. They are lying. Because I said before, go to the Bank of England website. Have a look at the, I think it's the M2 or M3. I think it's the M4. Is it M4? Is it? I can't remember. M M0 is the money. In the right. Thing. It's the one. It's on the Bank of England website. I've, I've, I've got dodgy memory anyway. But it's the one where all the money in circulation and the money held in banks. And they show those figures. And that figure is less than 1.1 1 .1 trillion. But the thing With, is also... The money that's in circulation are, promise, are mainly promissory notes, which are promises to pay a pound. So well, you, but it's just it's purely a promise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, no, that's very true, very true, Arthur. So, we're just thinking, like, what has the bailout cost us? Because we just, I mean, in America, it's absolutely mad. Are they seven and a half trillion dollars just to bail out the bank? That's not the national debt in America, but uh, we're going to look into that in a second. So, in the UK, we haven't been told exactly what the bailout has cost us. Uh, I've had sort of like I, I have heard reports of about four and a half thousand pounds per household. It's a lot of money for the banks bailing out the banks, the ones that couldn't make money out of making money out of thin air and then charging compound interest on it. I mean, it's a setup. It's a scam. It's because they allow small banks to fail so they can just turn them into, you know, it's the monopoly game happening where the ones with the most money eat up the smaller ones with less money. So it happens and it's that they take our houses off us, they take our wealth off us. And it's time we fight back. But anyway, we don't even know in this country. Uh, there we've got a, uh, this is money. The, he he the Treasury was hiding the true cost of the bailout. Remarkable. Remarkable. And then we've just got a lovely, uh, I really quite like that. Uh, you know, you, you've, got, you've got Wall Street, or you know, you might have the City of London, and then you've got the taxpayer, and then apparently you've got the markets. Well, actually, it's the wrong way around. You've actually got the taxpayer at the bottom, you've then got the markets, and you get the banks sat on top. So, uh, yeah. So, what we're going to ask is, how much does the UK government owe? Does anyone know? Oh, they do now. <laughs> I pressed the button a bit early. Estimates are that this year it will rise to 1.1 trillion pounds. So again, sorry? Sorry, uh, 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 shut the door. oh, shut the door, sorry, I, I can't from here, I can't read. <laughs> okay, so government estimates that in like 1.1 trillion, but the trouble is, we start, you know, we, have, we hear sort of like million and, you know, a billion here and, you know, a million here, billion here and a trillion, and it all just sort of ends up just numbers, doesn't it? And it's very difficult to actually think, well, does it really matter how many we are? What's a few noughts, you know? But anyway, what we'll do, 
we're just like, what I do, because I don't, I'm not very good at maths, and uh, unfortunately my, my work have actually made me do, I've now got to do an NVQ, uh, which is not very qualified, or not very quickly, I'm not sure, uh, two in numeracy, which I'm absolutely dreading, because it involves lots of sums. And I don't like particularly like numbers uh, and things like that. So uh, I like pictures. So we're going to start off with a £50 note. I haven't seen one of these, and so it's always nice to just have a slide of one. But anyway, just to give us an idea, we're going to start us thinking about sort of like how much these actual amounts are. So we'll just have a look. There's £50. And there is a nice little wad of 50s. And a packet of 150 uh, pound notes gives you a nice little wad, just over about half an inch thick. Uh, works out about, well, works out exactly 10,000 pounds. Okay, so that's one little wad. So, if you then scale that up, there we go. A million pounds is just like 100 little packets of 10,000. And you can fit that into a, well, fit a million pounds into there without any problem at all. It's quite heavy as well. No, it's a spare projector. No, you could get a million pounds in a, in a, in a, in a large, in a hold all, quite comfortably. So, uh, so that's what, a million pounds. So, what's a hundred million look like? A little bit more respectable, isn't it? Okay, so we're just trying to get our heads around like a difference between a million and, sorry, it, it, you know, it's like a, a million and then a, so a hundred million and then there you've got one billion. Okay? So, and that's all in 50 pound notes stacked up on pallet, yeah? Sorry, it should have billion, it says dollars, it shouldn't, sorry, that's a billion pound. It's actually the same because it, it works out, you can get them on the pallet. So, one trillion pounds. So you've seen it's about six, eight pounds, whatever, uh, for uh, a, a billion. So what's a trillion going to look like? Let's have a look. Now, that is stacked two pallets high, and it works out twice the area of a football pitch. <laughs> that is our national power. They reckon this year, government estimates, just the national debt, 1.1 trillion. That is it in 50 pound notes. If they had to count it, I, th I believe it would take 37,000 years to count it. I mean, it, it is so ridiculous. This is, this is the, they give us this stuff on the news and we all go, oh yeah, oh that's okay, it's okay because these are our leaders. It's not okay, this is bloody ridiculous. It can never be paid back. The interest alone is costing more than we pay in defence, which is a waste of money because our defence isn't anything about defence, because no one is attacking this country, but more than we spend, and we spend an awful lot of money on defence. It's more, almost more money than we are spending on education, and probably will be. That is just the interest we're paying on this. It is, it is draining all of us, because it's our resources that are being stolen. So, okay, it might be lots and lots of noughts, but paying the interest back is actually taking our work, our, you know, our toil. Now, so, just working on a trillion. So, one trillion, two, yeah, and that's two, stack two pallets high. So, a trillion grains of sand would weigh over 73 tonnes. I, you know, I love this. This is the sort of thing you can find out on Google. It would take seven, sorry, it would take 62 days for light to travel a trillion miles. It, it's just incredible. Oh, and one trillion dollars take end to end, or one million pounds, because they're about the same size, take end to end would stretch from the earth to the sun at its furthest distance from the sun. I mean, it's like, there's people that actually work these things out. It's great. But, you've got to realise, it's crazy. But, 
total UK borrowing, including its pension liabilities, is set at 4.8 trillion. Now, is, is it just me? Is it me that's mad, or is it the system? Because, you know, I, it, 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 I get stuck for words, which, which is difficult, but how, it, it, it's crazy, it is absolutely, we've ended up in a situation where money was never supposed to be, you know, something that's traded and, and creating negative money. What's it all about? There must be people sat thinking, wow, it's great, I'm owed five, almost five trillion pounds, you know, it, it's crazy. And so you're just going to look at the, uh, I like that one, it's something about uh, the debt ceiling is actually going through the ceiling. And it is, when you actually look at the graphs, uh, there are so many graphs, get on some of the government websites and look at the graphs and borrowing because they are going exponential. Because when you create money out of thin air and charge interest on it, you have to have more and more and more money added to it. This is why we're now seeing inflation starting to go up, even with a stagnant economy. So the economy is actually stalling and inflation is going up. It's called stagflation. It's what happens just before an economy crashes. And I think it's something to look forward to. It will crash. I can't tell you exactly when. Uh, I got the first, I got the September of 2007 correct, uh, a talk in, uh, in Bournemouth, but I, was wrong last year because I thought it was going to actually crash last year. I actually said November last year. But things, they, they pumped an awful lot of money into it. I mean, you just see graphs of the quantitative easing, and there you go. You know, you can see it's just going, it's actually skyrocketing. And money was never intended to be a commodity, it was meant to be a means of accounting. That's why the tally sticks worked really well because we could work out. How, how much we owed each other. And now it's become something that, you know, the highest paid people work in the city of London in this country, don't they? Because that's where, because they make money and, and it's almost like, whoa, these city kids, they're really clever. Well, no, they're just like part of the fraud. The reason bankers are paid so much is because they're at the top of the heap. And, and you know, they're, they're, it's, it's madness. Sooner or later, the whole thing will turn round, and you know we'll see the highest-paid people being you know people that work in nursing homes and and nurses and, and people who actually help in the community uh, and you know teachers and we'll, we'll we'll see that we will see it turn round. I'm sure of that. So uh, and this is a lovely quote from a, a friend of mine who used it on his uh, website, uh, The Inquiring Minds. This would be Malcolm on his Inquiring Minds website. And he uses the quote, when they create, the, this quote sums it up beautifully. When they create the debt-based money supply out of thin air, they don't create the interest. That is extracted from our common wealth. And so that is stolen from us, effectively. And that really, and all I can say really Fractional reserve banking has simply failed us. This system has failed us because it is no longer working for us. It is working for the banks perfectly and it has been designed by the banks by this. And the one that I missed out when I was going through all the rules of monopoly, the one I missed out was the game has to end sooner or later. It can't carry on. When you've got a, a game where money is going from one end to the other end of the board, it can't go on indefinitely. So it has to end. It has to stop. And I think it'd be wonderful when it does. Now we've actually got in January the Telegraph, uh, which, funny enough, I always thought it was the Tory graph, and but this goes way beyond party politics. But it occasionally, not that I'm buying the newspaper, but uh, occasionally it has been uh, having some quite interesting stories in there. So, just as a, uh, you know, basically, just in, uh, to sum up, some basic truths. The deficit can never be paid back, full stop. It cannot be paid back. So, you, you know, the system uh, it is broken. 
The cuts simply keep us enslaved, just prolong the agony. And the monetary, monetary system has to collapse. So what's going to happen if the economy collapses? You know, uh, it, 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 you know, it's like lots of people go, oh, but what about my pensions? I'm really worried about it. You know, there might be civil unrest rioting, but hopefully, you know, don't get drawn into that sort of like fighting, protesting, because it's just like negative energy. It's a matter of, you know, if, if you're going to... Although I, you know, feel very strongly with a lot of the sort of protests, it's like... Uh, I think Robert Menard would say that children protest. Uh, when you're an adult, you can just say, no, I'm not taking it. I don't want this. Just say no. It's very powerful. It's very powerful. So, will there be hunger and soup kitchens? Perhaps. You know, suddenly if the banking system goes down and people haven't got any money, they can't buy food. Uh, yeah, there might, it might be difficult. I don't know, to be honest. Uh, there might be martial law. Uh, and people say, well, what's going to happen to my pensions, my savings? And I, had, I did a talk uh, similar to this one uh, in Bournemouth the other day, and a guy came up to me at the end, and he was quite worried from what I'd said, because he said, well, I've got quite a bit of money invested, and I can't put it all in like, physical silver. It's like, and he was really, really worried. I'm saying, it's okay, because we're, we're so used to having to either save money or having something... Uh, of security, you know, if we can. People work really hard all their lives to have some sort of security. And that security, you can't find it outside yourself. Real security, you'll find deep inside yourself. Uh, I, I've, you know, I won't say I found this out, but it's like, I, I, I've had, in my life, I've had times where I've had lots of money, and I've had times where I've been really, really broke. And now, it really doesn't bother me either way. Uh, it's nice to have some money, but it's also quite interesting to uh, not have any money. You have to be really, really resourceful. As long as, long as you stay really positive and you keep that energy flowing, it's amazing what people can do. So, uh, let's just thinking about how would we survive if we have a meltdown. I think, yeah, there's a good chance that the banks might have to have a bank holiday while they sort out the mess and actually bring in some sort of currency that's of some sort of value. And I think, uh, I mean, they would love to microchip us. And if you get onto Alex Jones' website, he'll be talking about fear, fear, microchipping, FEMA camps. I don't see that. I see people waking up at a remarkable rate. And some people in the truth will say, yeah, but so many people are asleep, we can't wake everyone up. Well, we don't have to wake everyone up. The whole point is, I think if, if we wake up about 2% of the people, that's all that's necessary. Because there is something called the 100th monkey effect. Has anyone heard about it? Yeah, yeah. yeah it is a remarkable. Uh, it was after what, I'll just give you a quick brief overview of it. I think it was in the uh, Pacific. Uh, all these islands have been ravaged by napalm uh, during the Second World War, uh, where the Americans were fighting the Japanese. Uh, a lot of the indigenous monkey population were really uh, affected by what was going on. And after the war had finished, they were starving, basically. And so there were researchers from the university that actually went out and started feeding these monkeys and decided to do a project where they're actually going to uh, actually research them and, and actually watch them. And they fed them sweet potatoes. And after a while, there was a, a female that actually started washing the sweet potato because they tasted better without mud. And then her family started like doing the same thing, washing their, uh, her sweet potatoes, their sweet potatoes. And then after a while, the whole island, on this one island, all the monkeys started washing their sweet potatoes. Now, at some point, whether it was the hundredth monkey or hundredth and one monkey, all the other monkeys in all the surrounding islands, even though monkeys weren't swimming between islands, all the other islands started washing, all the monkeys on the islands started washing their sweet potatoes. Once we rise up in consciousness, as it's happening very, very quickly, 10 years ago, we never got people talking about this sort of thing, uh, even in Top Nets, uh, which is a pretty switched on place. But it, it's a remarkable how people are waking up, and they're waking up for a reason, because there is a shift happening in consciousness. And, of course, don't panic. 
don't panic because a lot of people think, oh my God, you know, I'm going to lose all my money or, yeah, I'm really scared. But, uh, you know, and as I said earlier, quoting uh, David Icke, uh, there is nothing to fear about the imminent collapse of the global financial prison. Because the way I see it, okay, I mean, these aren't battery hens, but, uh, and uh, apparently that if, if you want to make hens uh, free range, all you have to do is open the barn door and they're free range. Because they're not going to go outside because they're scared. They're thinking, well, we know, we've got everything we need in here. We've got, you know, we've got feed, we've got, you know, fluorescent light. Why would we want to go outside? Far too scary. It could be really scary, it could be boxes, there might be machine guns, it could be anything, you know, it's like, uh, because, but of course, it always takes one chicken to actually stick his head out and you know how they go, and uh, Alistair does, he's got chicken, and you know, and it takes one, and then the others will follow. And I think that, you know, the people here tonight, we're the, you know, we're the brave ones that are actually thinking outside the box and looking at different realities. Because it's infinitely what we've got to look forward to without being uh, subservient to the banks and the law courts, and uh, I'm not, well, I'm talking about the statute law courts, because uh, I think we need a return to common law and not this fictional maritime statute law. But as I say, that's another subject in itself. So uh, yeah, we have our freedom to come because I really see it as uh, an awakening, the hundredth monkey effect. People are waking up to who they are beyond just the sort of physical object and uh, you know, a husband or a wife or a worker or, or whatever. So, uh, yeah. And we're about to go through monumental changes, I'm sure of that. And I'm sure you can feel it as well. I, I, I can feel something about to happen. And don't explain to me how I know or why, but the fact that we're all here tonight just, just gives us evidence of that. And the, the TBTB is the powers that be. They may be powerful with their media, money, and armed thugs, but we are infinitely more powerful. Yeah. That was infinitely more powerful, even. Uh, and it's time to step into that power. So, what can we do? Positive, direct, non-violent action to bring about change. Just get information out to people. Tell people about the corrupt banking system. Tell them about 9-11, if you've looked into that. Tell them about 7-7, chemtrails, whatever it is that, that it's sort of like you're passionate about. Just tell people about it. If they're not interested, then don't. Well, you know, you're best off rather than like doing what I did, which was like just getting really angry and like mouthing off in my local pub. I actually like started talking to people, but plant seeds, just mention things. Hey, have a look at this. You know, oh, I saw this really interesting video, you know. Go to uh, Paradigm Shift TV, have a look at their website, BBC Five, whatever, you know. So, uh, you know, just try and keep, you know, away from people. Uh, keep an open heart and an open mind and be the change you want to see. And I'm just finishing off now. Words from the uh, Hopi Indian prophecy. You have been telling the people that this is the 11th hour. Now you must go back and tell the people this is the hour. And I'm just going to finish with uh, a very quick, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to turn around to, to I can't read it on my computer. To my fellow swimmers, there is a river flowing very fast. It is so swift, there are those who will be afraid. They will try to hold on to the shore. They will feel they are being torn apart and will suffer greatly. Know that the river has a destination. The elders say we must let go of the shore, push off into the middle of the river. And I say, see who is there with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment we do, our spiritual growth comes to a halt. The time of the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves together as we are tonight. Banish the word struggle from your attitude and your vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. 
for we are the ones we've been waiting for. Thank you. Good night.